Today, my guest is sculptor Zenos Frudakis, who designed the Honor Guard bronze sculpture at the Air Force Memorial in Arlington, Virginia. The Air Force Memorial is the newest in the uh, D.C. area. Now, Zenos is an academician of the National Academy of Design in New York and a fellow of the National Sculpture Society. He has created over 100 larger-than-life and portrait busts for public and private collections, including, among others, General Douglas MacArthur for the MacArthur Memorial Foundation and, Pen- and the Pentagon, and General George C. Marshall, Marshall Foundation, Virginia Military Institute in Lexington, Virginia. Zenos holds a Master's and Bachelor's of Fine Art from the University of Pennsylvania and attended Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia by scholarship. He served on the board of directors of the National Sculpture Society for six years and on the editorial board of Sculpture Review for three years. He was invited to participate in the third Rodin Grand Prize exhibition at Hakone Open Air Museum, where he received the Hakone Award. The Japanese press called him the American Rodin. Zenos, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, uh, Jacqueline. It's wonderful to uh, to be on your show. Thank you very much. Let's start out, Zenos, by first of all describing briefly, because we'll get into some more details, the Air Force Honor Guard statue and its relationship to the Air Force Memorial itself, which is a large, large, uh, gorgeous, spired memorial. Uh, yes. Well, when I was... Um called uh, by the Air Force for the, to uh, work on this project. Uh, that was before there were spires uh, being planned. There was going to be actually a building there um, uh, that was for educational purposes. And um, the sculpture of the Honor Guard, as you know, the Honor Guard is, is um, uh, the guard that's there for special events, and uh, it has two figures with flags in the center, American flag and the Air Force flag with the uh, banners, streamers, and the... Um, uh, two figures on either side holding uh, rifles on their shoulders. and um, Yes, and uh, it greets the visitors as you come in. The Honor Guard uh, sculpture is standing there, and it's so impressive. It's so realistic that you immediately feel that it is the Honor Guard, uh, and they're absolutely incredible. Uh, what artists have inspired you in your work, Zenos? Um, well, uh, Augusta St. Gordon's, his Shaw Memorial, the uh, sculpture of many people will remember for, uh, that inspired the movie um, Glory. Uh, that was that's in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, it's the Robert the Guild Shaw Memorial, where you see a figure uh, on a horse uh, that was uh, killed in, in battle from the Civil War, and uh, and the uh, he, has, he he led a entirely uh, African American uh, uh, group of soldiers and. Uh, and uh, that was inspiring because, for a couple reasons, for the uh, the concept and also and the uh, skill of the, that the sculptor had in making it. I think he's the greatest American sculptor, to my mind. Yes, and uh, I do want to tell the listeners that uh, uh, there there is a book that's been produced called the United States Air Force Memorial Honor Guard, uh, a sculpture by Dennis uh, Frudakis. Uh, there's, it's filled with uh, wonderful photographs of the Honor Guard, and there is a picture also of the uh, of the work that you uh, are referring to uh, featuring uh, Shaw. Uh, and the book was um, compiled and written uh, by uh, Rosalie uh, Fridakis. But it's a wonderful uh, edition. And as I understand it, people uh, can purchase this book also through the Air Force Association, the Air well, Force I, Memorial. I think on Amazon. And and I'm sure on on yeah, Amazon, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, but it is a, a lovely book. Well, what's interesting about it, I think it does explain the whole process, which is how a sculpture is made from uh, beginning to end, technically, in terms of sculpting it and casting it. Yes, yes. And, and it's and it's not just the way I did the, the this particular statue, but it's universally how most bronze statues are made. And when you see them in a city, um, you'll know when you're looking at the sculpture how it was made. It wasn't you know, created. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Full, full grown. Um, uh, yes. Uh, I, well, I, w- what I was about to, to say was that uh, Bowling Air Force Base is the home of the Air Force uh, Honor Guard, yes. uh, which you visited to, to learn about the Honor Guard and sure. to use 
uh, models for your work. And how did your uh, being there physically and seeing the men and women that are, are training as honor guard and seeing actual honor guards affect the development of the sculpture? Um, well, uh, Pete Lindquist, who was the, a retired colonel who was uh, my, uh, the person I worked with with the Air Force in creating this project, took me to the, uh, the base so I can see the, the cream of the of the um, honor guard, the, uh, the, the, these are the ones that uh, are used by the President of the United States and for the, the, the most important events. And I got to see these uh, uh, um, wonderful um, young people who, uh, who, who look great in their uniforms, and I got to see their work ethic, and, and, uh, and they work so hard at what they do and, and, uh, and how they, uh, um, you know, they, they just dress impeccably. and. Uh, and and I watched them march, and I and I took many photographs of them, and interviewed them, and and um, I drew from them when I uh, did my sculpture. You know, originally the sculpture was going to be more general than it turned out to be. It it evolved. It sometimes, well, as often sculptures do. It, originally, it was going to be a very sketchy looking piece, almost impressionistic, um, one that. Uh, where you'd you'd hard, be hard pressed to 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 see a portrait of a particular person or um, a particular even gender or race. It was going to be very very general. And as we developed the piece, we realized that the honor guard nearly always is represented by um, uh, both genders and 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 there's is multiracial. And so we wanted to get that element in the sculpture. So um, we made it more specific. And I actually had a, uh, several young women who posed for the female. And uh, and uh, people, uh, I had the Hispanic person pose for one of the figures, and uh, an African American, a couple African Americans posed for the the African American figure, and and uh, several people posed for the Caucasian. So it was, it represents uh, all of uh, the, the the diverse uh, airmen, um, as it does in real life. Yes. And uh, while we're talking about that and, and the relationship to the, the spires of the, of the memorial itself, there are uh, three, three spires, yes. uh, and they're located at the highest point in Arlington National Cemetery, and the tallest spire is 270 feet in the air that yeah. marks the location of this memorial, and it's designed to resemble the sure. bomb burst maneuver of the well, Thunderbird was, uh, demonstration, uh, and and here three. standing there is the honor guard. Now, yeah. uh, how how tall are the figures? Well, the figures are eight feet tall each, and then the flags are another additional eight feet. So the two center figures are sixteen feet. And I worked with Jim Freed, who was the architect uh, for the for that project. And um, originally, that as I said, that was going to be a building, and. Um, I always thought that they should have something taller and actually suggested uh, spiral, stainless spiral uh, elements. And um, they uh, uh, created this particular piece from it once they decided to move away from the building, once the Air Force decided they didn't, didn't want a building. You know, originally there was also going to be, it was going to be at another location near the Marine Memorial. And the Marines um, didn't, they didn't want the want it that close to their own memorial. For some uh, reason. Yes, I, uh, there was yes, some I, controversy. I don't know if you remember that. Oh yes, I do. And yeah. and uh, and actually, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Colonel Boyne uh, next week uh, yes. uh, about it, and he's going to go into the history uh, of all of that. And of course, it's appropriate that we're doing it at this time because uh, it is the uh, Air Force, the birthday of the Air Force. Uh, oh. So it's appropriate that we are talking about mm. all of this, and and since you you brought up the early uh, the start uh, of the concept, I mean it was years and years in the making. Yes. It was going to be a star shaped building, I believe, at one point. And, right. Uh, and well, um, once they moved to the higher ground, then they could also then they were allowed to have a higher structure, and that's when I also had been suggesting to Pete uh, Linquist and. And Ed Grillo, who was running the project, that they would be, I thought it would be great to have something tall and stainless, and, and so that's what the direction they went. Well, it's very impressive, and I, I, uh, I visited uh, the area last week for the uh, Air Force uh, celebration, and uh, uh, driving in or flying in, you, you see it from all over, yeah. so it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful 
uh, uh, look, but also yeah. when you visit it in person, as I say, and you enter, and there's the honor guard to greet you. It's 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 so impressive. Uh, let's talk a little bit about now. Okay, when you came into it, uh, as you said, originally your concept was a little more general and a little yeah. more generic. How how did it how did it develop then from? Uh, that point. Talk a little bit about your early process and what your early thoughts were. Well, I think at one point, too, there was talk of, of there being real flags. And I told them that I thought that uh, that would make the sculptures of the of the uniformed men, um, of the uniformed um, airmen, which includes the women, um, into a kind of very fancy uh, flag holder. So I said, I, th- I thought the flag should be part of the sculpture. And it, it was tricky to sculpt it that way with the flagpole and as thin as it is. And, and uh, there were some problems there. But um, they, uh, they understood that that would be a, a better solution. Yeah. And, and uh, also, um, uh, as I say, moved, away, moved them away from the sketchiness of the figures because I did think that it should represent the, the, the diverse group of airmen that are in the Air Force. Sure. As, as the honor guard does. But before and, uh, you yeah. came to, uh, I, I, uh, excuse me for interrupting, oh, but I, I think it's important to uh, mention the fact that uh, you didn't start out this way with the idea of the honor guard because there were a lot of people involved in designing this uh, memorial and there was a lot of discussion and, and also your early designs uh, I I remember seeing pictures of some of yes. the early designs, and they were low to the ground. And well, Jacqueline, I think you're referring to the relief. They were um, what's called bas relief, and bas meaning it's a low a low relief or mezzo relief, which is a middle relief. And at one point, they were when uh, the idea was first brought to me, the idea was for it to be a sculpture in relief um, on a on, and with a, a heavy stone behind it, and anchoring it to a stone. And I. I felt like the figure should be freestanding, and um, I made an argument for it, and I made several models to show them, because sometimes people need to see it. I can visualize what they're going to look like at, uh, at the completion of a sculpture. I've done so many of these, and uh, sometimes people can't visualize it uh, uh, that well. But once they saw the small models, and that's why you do small models, which are called maquettes, um, they're several inches high. Um, I showed them how the freestanding sculpture I thought would be more interesting um, within the uh, a heavy stone with a bronze relief on it, and they uh, uh, realized that that was a better solution. So that's what we ended up doing. And we went through a couple of. I mean, there were many small models that I did before we uh, uh, decided on, on this particular. Well, yes, and as an artist, uh, yeah. y- you had to deal with several people on several committees yeah. <laughs> that had all had their own ideas and doing. Uh, I think it's it's important for listeners to understand, too, that uh, any time an artist is doing a piece of artwork that's go- a public uh, piece of artwork, there's a lot of parameters. But certainly doing something in the D.C. area had to have been in itself just filled with uh, uh, parameters that you had to adhere to. Uh, yes, there's within the group. You, know, you have strong personalities and and uh, people who are accomplished and and uh, and of course they have strong opinions, and you have to be knowledgeable enough and have the kind of authority that your uh, knowledge gives you that people um, can see uh, why it's it's best to do uh, what you're suggesting, and also you have the politics of Washington D.C. and we had a little bit of that. And I want to ask you, how did the precise stance and movement of the honor guard affect your representation? I know you spent a lot of time and a lot of taking photographs and watching them. Yes. Well, as I said, originally it was going to be a very sketchy piece. And um, we, um, the Air Force started bringing um, um, a, a woman who actually makes their uniforms, who is a, um, she, she was their tailor, to, our, to my studio to see what I was doing. And they also um, they brought people who review the honor guard, and uh, every the actual honor guard. So they began to look at the sculpture as if it was the honor guard. Yes, and, uh, yes. And so they started to <clears throat> to uh, criticize it in the way they would the actual honor guard. And you know, when the real honor guard, if there's a little thread hanging off, they'll burn it off 
you know, if it's hanging off the coat or they'll, I mean, they, they, everything is so, so precise. They measure everything with almost a micrometer. It's just a extreme precise in, in the actual living honor guard. And they started to do that with the sculpture, which I, it, it just increasingly as the weeks passed, and this went on for about five years. For how long? More, how long did it go on? I think it was about five years from beginning to end. But uh, the, I think a couple of years in, in the large size. I actually did a nine-foot model that I began at one point of the figures, and then they felt it was a little too large, so I, went, I started over again and did it eight feet. But most large sculptures like this, traditionally, you make what's called a maquette, which is a small conceptual model where you, it's very sketchy and you're just developing your idea. And once you get the okay, then you move into what's called a third-scale model, and which I did was a sort of a size in between, and then you move into the big one. You don't go from the small model right to the large one. Yes. You're, you're sort of developing problems, and uh, you're solving problems in these various uh, stages. Because by the time you get to the large one, uh, this piece was 16 feet high when it was with the flags, you don't have, you have to have a very sturdy armature, and it's, it's, you're past the time when you should be making major changes. Mm -hmm. You have to develop that in the smaller models. So when you see large sculptures, uh, out in public squares, and, and uh, that's generally how they were done. Um, in this case, you know, I had to have the right um, stripes, the right uh, you know, the um, metals. They had to be in the in the in the right place. I mean, and, if, and again, it had to be perfectly. I, I mean, there was um, the person who was in charge of the honor guard uh, looked at it and said to me, "It's perfect." At the end, said everything is exactly where it should be. Absolutely. And. and um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, that's satisfying, although, you know, for art, usually you think that you are you can be a lot more flexible. But uh, this was um, something besides art that it was. Uh, and also talking about the, the streamers were very complicated to do. And there's a wonderful photograph of that uh, in the book as well. The battle streamers in clay yeah. look so... Well, like, like streamers. Yeah, it's, and, of course, helpful. you're an artist, but it, it's well, amazing yeah. to me. It was it was difficult. I mean, there are challenges here, and uh, making the, the, all those streamers with the and to and to pull them out so that you could see the various important battles, and some I think more more significant than others. And even though they are they're they're together in a certain I think it was in chronological, but there's certain uh, uh, order. <clears throat> the important ones, some of the important ones, had to show up over some of the others, so I had to pull the streamers out and. Anyway, it was a very interesting process. Well, yes, and you know, and I agree with that. Uh, uh, for for this uh, uh, art piece, it was more than an art piece, and it did have to be perfect, and it was perfect, and is Thank perfect, you. and that's that's the other thing that is so impressive. That even though they are these eight feet tall figures, they are real people standing there. Well, I wanted that to have to have a sense of life and to have a sense so that they weren't just mannequins and they weren't. I mean, there are real people posed for them, and uh, they, a couple of them are very close to the people that act to, uh, specific people, and a couple of the others are a little more generalized. Yes. Uh, and they also uh, have. Uh, I put a blue patina on the sculpture, which is very unusual instead of a brown patina because of the blue uniforms of the uh, the Air Force. It's kind of a blue black patina. It's kind of, kind of hard to make it too blue. Mm -hmm. But. Um, it's, I thought that was unusual as well. Yes. Uh, now, uh, when when was the decision made to make the flags part of the sculpture? As you said, you didn't want yes. it to look like uh, an exotic flag holder. H yes. How did that? Uh, and when did? In in what part of the process did that come about? That was still part of the small model stage. The uh -huh. stage, and um, I could show them the committee um, at that. Size, I think they were about 12 inches high. That uh, it looked better with the actual flags, and they saw that. And uh, it was easier to make the argument when I could make the argument uh, so visual for them. Yes. Well, of course, I think most of us would have difficulties visualizing an artistic yeah. concept. Now, uh, how how difficult is it to go from clay models and and you made. You made clay models, eight foot clay models, yes, uh, yes. of course, which is part yes. of the of the process. But yes. how tough is it to go from clay models to the bronze fabrication? And could you describe briefly how that all works? Because that that is an amazing process to me. Sure, and and uh, this isn't something that I do directly. I have a bronze foundry. That of course, does. this is what sculptors do generally. They have a 
they're, they're fortunate they have a, and I have a great bronze foundry that I've been using for about 25 years. Uh, this one is in Chester, Pennsylvania. It's called Loran Bronze. And they actually also cast the World War II Memorial for another sculptor. And um, they're, they have a lot, they have the experience, and uh, they worked very closely with me on it. And what happens is you have the clay models, and they come in and they, they make rubber molds on the clay models in my studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, they took, I think they took some of it away to the foundry and, and made the molds there. Um, then they take the rubber away from the clay, and then you, the clay pieces basically can be trashed after that because you've got the rubber mold. Well, and they're make. made, uh, aren't they, like, for instance, they don't, they don't make a rubber mold of the full body. They make a mold maybe of the head or the torso. Is that how it works? And then... Well, they, they did make, they made a rubber mold, I think, of the whole, of, of, of all of it. Uh-huh, they did. The, the guns, yes, all of it. And, I mean, they make, it's a lot of pieces. I forgot how many there were. There might have been 17 or 18 mold pieces for each figure. Yes, and I'm looking at one now of the torso. Yes. And, and the flags were extremely complicated, especially, especially the one with the battle streamers. And, um, and uh, they, um, once they've made the rubber mold, then they pour wax, into hot wax, into the mold, into the rubber, and, uh, and then take the rubber away. And then you've, I have an exact replica of the clay sculpture, but I have it in wax. Mm. And then I take the wax, and I work the wax. And I had a couple of very good assistants who worked with me. I had three um, yeah, who, who, who worked with me on... on the different stages. And, uh, and at the bronze foundry, I went in there and I worked on the waxes. And then when the waxes was, were finished, they, they took the different parts and they dipped it in a ceramic material, a liquid material that hardened over the wax. And so that when they heated up the, the whole thing, the wax would pour out and leave a hollow space where it was in this ceramic shell. They call it ceramic shell. And they would, could pour the bronze in. It's called lost wax process because you lose your mm-hmm. wax. An and ancient, uh, very it, old process. It's ancient. It hasn't really changed that much. Yes. And then uh, when it cools off, they knock away the ceramic material, and it's almost like a kind of a birthing process or something, or, or like an eggshell that's being broken off, and you see the sculpture come through. And, uh, and then when all the pieces have the shell broken away off of it, and you have the bronze, and it's raw bronze, you have to weld it together the different parts, and and uh, you always lose a little bit between the casting. You have to f- uh, fix the little pinholes, the different things that didn't come, didn't uh, cast properly. You have to fix that, and uh, and um, and w- went over the whole piece and heated up with a torch and put acids on it to get the blue color. Well, uh, and and uh, but before you did that, before you actually started on the patina. Yes. Uh, the sculptures had to be reviewed. Uh, oh, yes, they were reviewed at every stage. Yes, and um, and even after the patina, I had to actually talk them into the blue patina because I think at one point uh, uh, the architect uh, Jim Fried thought he would prefer the brown, and I I told him I thought it would be the blue would be a little bit more appropriate in this case, not just because the Air Force uh, uh, uniform is blue, but also because there was a kind of a gray color from the stone in the, uh, at the site. And I yes. thought the blue would go a little better with some of the, and the stainless, it would go better with the stainless spires than brown wood, than a warm brown, which is more traditional looking. So here you are going through this process, and each part of the process is being reviewed by General Grillo. Now, who was General Grillo? Grillo? Yes. yes, he was a uh, uh, in charge of, of the uh, of the project, uh huh. And Pete Lindquist was involved, and several of the honor yeah. guard specialists came in also to yes, check along yeah. the way. The thing that was interesting to me too was the fact that uh, uh, Major General Grillo uh, viewed the sculptures and actually uh, assisted the the men in the foundry uh, by uh, helping them uh, verbally telling them how to correctly align the folds on the flags. I mean, that's amazing to me, yeah. this whole process. Yes. And um, everybody, you know, uh, contributed. It was, uh, it, was, it was great that way. And I think there was a lot of good feeling in the project. And, and I'm, of course, I'm, I'm honored to have done it and to have one of the... Um, Military, um, um, uh, what would you call it? Um, it it's, it's one of the service uh, memorials. Is you know the, the Marines have the have theirs, and the Navy has theirs. You know the, the Marine one, of course, is the Iwo Jima Memorial, and the Marine and the Navy has one in Washington D.C. That's the Navy Memorial, and this is the Air Force Memorial. So I'm, yes, I'm very, which uh, which took a a, a long time before the 
the memorial actually came together. I, well, I can certainly understand why you you would be so proud to uh, to do this. This 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 is something that uh, uh, decades, centuries, maybe even yeah. if we're that lucky from now, yeah. people will be talking about you like they talk about the artist who did the the Shaw uh, piece. <laughs> Well, there's also, I didn't mention, there's stainless inside the bronze. That helps um, uh, many times um, hollow bronze uh, sculptures, if, they're, if they need the reinforcement, uh, they have uh, stainless inside them to help uh, with the structure. And so there's very heavy stainless pieces that come out of the bottom of each sculpture. So they can't just be pushed over. Or if there's a heavy storm, sculptures have to be able to withstand, I think it's 100 mile per hour winds. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly can do that. Well, uh, and the uh, the welding process was interesting too because uh, uh, they had to make sure in fabricating this that the pieces uh, the there were parts of the sculpture that had to be welded together, and they had to make sure that all of the seams and yeah. everything were were ground ground away. And well, they have to be invisible. Yes, you can't really see any seam lines and. Uh, and of course, I was there for all of that and supervised it and worked on it. Of course. And um, I think with some of the Rodin sculptures, for example, since many of them have been cast after he died, they leave some of the seams because they want to show that the art, they weren't over clean, that they weren't over yes. someone else's hand hasn't uh, uh, um, taken away some of the modeling of the sculptor mm -hmm. by grinding it. Or since I was there, of course, I can make sure that the, I, and I did, that the seams were invisible. And, uh, we also, uh, at the end, had to wax the sculpture. We don't want to forget about that. And they're waxed, and they actually have a kind of acrylic. There's a, there's a covering that helps protect it from uh, the elements, and also a wax on top of that. Uh, very quickly, Zenos, uh, how long did the process take of the bronze fabrication? Oh, how, can you give me some idea of uh, what period of well, time? Generally, that it takes about four or five Four months to do something like that, but I think this took this took considerably longer. And I'm trying to remember how long. If it was eight or nine months, it would uh, seem that it would because it was. It, it was a long process. And things had to be approved, and you had yeah. to be there and getting people together and and so well, they, forth. You know, it was it was like a very elaborate and and complicated puzzle to see the different pieces on the on the floor of the uh, foundry, especially the uh, battle streamers and flags and. And they had to. It, it had to be. Um, they, they, there was a. There was. They. They marked them so that they. They were able to put them back together again once they were. Uh, once uh, they were all in pieces, and uh, so that was a complicated problem. I'm glad that uh, they're so competent there at the foundry. They were so. Uh, they did such a good job. It, it, well, it, certainly it, you're an artist, and an artist is always thinking about its next, the, his or her next work. But it seems to me, after something like this, that's so important and so prominent, uh, you, you're happy, I'm sure, when it's finished. But did you miss the process once it was finished? Or oh, were I you? have. Yes. yes, I have. I mean, I've moved on to... You know, many other large uh, monuments. I'm doing a 50-foot piece now, and um, many things. And, and it's just, but in sports figures, and you know, sculpted on a Palmer and Jack Nicholas and a lot of other people. But it's uh, this was special. It, it was a great group of people. It was certainly uh, a wonderful opportunity to do uh, something for uh, the Air Force and and to have it in Arlington National Cemetery. I mean, Absolutely. What, I mean, can you have you a better location? It. Yes. Yes. I have been in the. I have been there, and I don't know if this happened while you were there. And I've I've actually heard taps, and I've heard gunshots, and you know from the cemetery. Yes, I have too. And you know, Zenos, on that note, I'm afraid I have to say goodbye. I'm so pleased to have had you here with us, and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing your future work. Thank you so much for Thank being you, here, Jacqueline. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. This is the Jacqueline Bacher Show, and I'll be right back. Hold on, please.